Welcome this, this morning to the University of Maine School of Law, and thank you for weathering the weather to get here. Um, and welcome to the continuing celebration of Judge Frank Coffin's centennial year. My name is Peter Pittagoff. I'm a professor at Maine Law. And on behalf of the law school, uh, I'm pleased and honored to welcome a wonderful panel behind me um, of five former clerks of Judge Coffin and two former Coffin Family Law Fellows. They're going to discuss their work in the public interest uh, and the judge's influence on their uh, careers and themselves. Uh, in a moment, they'll each introduce uh, themselves. Um, and in fact, there are handouts that have bios um, of the panelists. There's also a handout that has, that has bios of some of you. Uh, there are many people in the audience. There are uh, some two dozen clerks, former clerks of Judge Coffin, who joined us uh, for this, and we're so honored um, that they're here. Um, they're also members of the Coffin family. We're delighted to see you again this morning. Um, and uh, again, we had a reminder last night with uh, Richard Maiden's great Coffin lecture, just how amazing a person Judge Coffin was. And we each knew Judge Coffin in our own way. I think Richard Maiden has uh, done so much research and has a wider view than any, any one of us. So, so thank you, Richard, for a great presentation last night. I can't wait to read the biography. So this morning, we're going to continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Judge Coffin. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, there are refreshments, as many of you noticed, uh, out in the lobby. So when we're finished, please stick around and uh, enjoy the refreshments, mingle, talk, meet some of the uh, uh, other wonderful and distinguished guests in the audience and our uh, panel. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Richard O'Meara. Dick O'Meara is a partner at Murray Plum and Murray. He will moderate the panel and uh, eventually open it up. <laughs> open it up to uh, a full discussion. So thank you all for joining. Good morning and welcome to the Coffin Centennial panel. Our focus today is going to be on the judge's legacy, specifically his impact on the future generations of lawyers. Uh, following his example of dedicating themselves to public service. I have been asked to moderate this panel, uh, but moderation is not the appropriate thing to do when describing the judge's impact in this area. Um, last night at the 27th uh, Coffin Lecture that Professor Richard Maiden so expertly uh, gave us, he recounted Judge Coffin's illustrious career as a public servant. He served as a naval officer in the Pacific Theater during World War II, worked in the Legal Aid Bureau at Harvard Law School, represented Maine in the House of Representatives for two terms. He led the Kennedy administration's foreign aid efforts, served 41 years on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, and helped to found and lead Maine's Justice Action Group to address the unmet legal needs of Maine's poor. When it came to public service, he was nonstop. He was a giant. Now, all of this was keeping with his plan for becoming a lawyer in the first place. Uh, here's one of his journal entries as he prepared to head off to Harvard Law School. He said, I am to study law with the intention of using it as a tool for social progress. I shall aim at the very top. I pray God I shall never be blinded from seeing this social goal by any personal considerations. God give me humility, patience, ability, willpower, and humor. So we've assembled an excellent panel for you today. But before we delve into this serious topic, uh, please allow me to take one quick detour at the outset. Uh, as Professor Maiman mentioned uh, during his superb lecture, the judge not only was humble, probably would have been very uncomfortable with events like this celebrating his life and legacy, but he had a remarkably playful side to him. And those of us fortunate enough to have been mentored by him, uh, it was the judge's incredibly sharp, often self-deprecating sense of humor, especially his love of witty wordplay that made him so endearing to us. And I thought of this while trying to imagine his reaction. Were he to have logged in from the afterlife this week? <laughs> I'm curious about how the law school that he so loved would be uh, celebrating his 100th birthday. And unfortunately, were, to he have, were he uh, to have Googled 
Coffin Centennial to learn about this week's events, he would have immediately come face to face with uh, the corporate homepage for the Centennial Casket Corporation. <laughs> This is terrible. Even better, under the images tab, he would have seen three photographs of premium caskets from Centennial before his own portrait was in the fourth slot. Uh, today's panel assembled to focus on the judge's legacy of lawyers dedicating themselves to public interest pursuits Fe features six speakers. They fall into two groups uh, the judge's former law clerks and the former Coffin Family Law Fellows who worked in his name for Pine Tree Legal Assistance. Let me begin by sketching a brief summary of each group. I'm going to let them introduce themselves individually. Over his lengthy judicial career from 1965 through 2006, Judge Coffin employed, mentored, and entertained 68 law clerks. He considered his clerks to be integral members of his extended family, and he forged deeply meaningful personal relationships with each of us, which endured for the rest of his life. Sometimes the words chosen for a collective noun can conjure up an essential characteristic shared by the group's members. When we speak of a group of hens, we call them a brood. When we talk about a flock of beautiful finches, they're called a charm. We refer to a shrewdness of apes, a pride of lions. So it is with the coffee clerks. Because for many years now, we've collectively been known as the clever. And for reasons that perhaps will become obvious when you hear from some of them as panelists today, many members of the Clever have taken inspiration from the judge uh, to pursue a public interest career or otherwise become deeply involved in public interest pursuits. Uh, several dozen are in the audience today, as, as uh, Dean Pitagoff mentioned. Uh, they're ready to speak with any of the aspiring lawyers here who want to know more about their paths. Uh, one, Judge Bill Kayada, who's here with us today, even sits in the judge's former seat on the First Circuit now. He's, his clerks have done an amazing uh, amount of public service work. I invite you all to talk to them about it. Today we're going to present you a sampling of the Clever, four lawyers whose clerkships spanned a period from 25 years, from the early 70s into the mid-90s. We have Bill Kelly, all right, 1971-72, Janet Sable, directly behind him, 1984-85, Sharon Beckman, who was my co-clerk in 1986 and 87, Paul Zimmerman, 1994 and 1995. I want to let them all do their own bragging about what they've done, so I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> Joining them on the panel this morning, though, are two former Coffin Fellows, each of whom has tirelessly provided legal services to low-income Mainers in family law matters through Pine Tree Legal Assistance. Back in 1998, uh, 12 Portland law firms agreed to fund two positions at Pine Tree to address the long, unmet legal needs uh, at the urging of Judge Coffin. The project now bears the judge's name in honor of his tireless work in the service of access to justice through the Justice Action Group. Here's what the judge had to say about this program, which is now in its third decade of existence when he addressed the fellows. He said, to know that the leading law firms in this community are renewing and even increasing their efforts to make it possible for deeply dedicated young lawyers to devote themselves to serving troubled families in the most agonizing times, in fellowships bearing my name, is the most meaningful honor I can imagine. So today we welcome Melissa Martin and Caroline Hova, former Coffin Fellows. They'll describe the program to you in greater detail and help you understand how this legacy of the judge has so positively addressed previously unmet legal needs in our state. We will have time for audience discussion and questions at the end. But let me start, we're gonna start in order of seniority. <laughs> being the old guy in the room. <laughs> um, so we heard last night from uh, Richard Mayman uh, that the judge didn't like to toot his own horn. And uh, I don't like to toot my own horn either, and it isn't quite as loud as the judge's horn. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's what I've been asked to do, so I'm going to walk through my own personal journey uh, to doing public interest work. So I, after clerking for the judge, I uh, then clerked for Justice Powell, and then I had to, had to proceed to active duty in the Navy. So I found myself working on the staff of the personal staff of the Secretary of the Navy, eight people. Uh, the Secretary that was there when I started was a pretty decent guy, uh, sent, uh, ended up being Senator John Warner from, from Virginia later in life. But uh, after a couple of years or a year and a half, the, uh, 
the role changed. So we had a, I'm not going to use his name, but we had a complete ass. <laughs> 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 as a replacement, uh, who, who was, you know, apart from disagreement about politics, was just, was just impossible to, to, to stand. So we, we'd have a staff meeting, there'd be eight of us around the room, and he would go on some rant that was, you know, uh, that uh, might have been uh, foreshadowed some of what we've <laughs> on Twitter, and so I, I was desperate to find something else to do, um, uh, and so I uh, I went to the Pentagon's uh, internal kind of, uh, policy planning office and landed a job. Um, took it back to the secretary and the staff, and the secretary wouldn't let me accept the job because he thought it would reflect badly on him that I had chosen to go from a, from the secretary's office down to this you know. Staff office. I mean, it, it, it was just it was just terrible. So, so I had to figure out what to do. This is how serendipity has played into my uh, my overall career. So I talked to some friends who had uh, practiced law in Los Angeles, who told me that Carla Hills, who had just been appointed Secretary of HUD, uh, was a terrific person, and I ought to I ought to talk to her. So I did, and I got her to make me an offer. I wrote her a letter, uh, and then I, then I wrote uh, the, the letter for the Secretary of the Navy to accept this. I went over on active duty to the Department of Housing and Urban Development and found my my mission in life. Basically, uh, it was it was uh, it was extraordinary. Um, a footnote: Two weeks later, uh, Senator Proxmire from Wisconsin, who chaired the Appropriations Subcommittee that covered housing, but also chaired the Armed Services Committee, put out a list uh, that said uh, the Pentagon was taking over the civilian branches of government by placing people. You know, important <laughs> policy. <laughs> there I was on the list. About 50 people, so the Pentagon, the general council, whom I'd gotten to know pretty well, called me up and said, you know, uh, if you want to make the Navy a career, we're happy to take the heat, but if not, we'll let you go. So I got off, I finished my active duty uh, a year earlier uh, than expected. I uh, doubled my salary. Um, and, and as a lifelong Democrat, was still able to work in the Republican administration because I had already entered the the fold on active duty from the military. Hmm. So there I was. So that's that's really how I got started in, in what's become my main, you know, public interest focus. Uh, so uh, I then went into uh, uh, after I guess about 18 months at HUD, where I worked full time uh, around the clock, basically uh, working with uh, the bureaucracy. So I learned some skills about how to deal with the bureaucracy. I Owned my policy skills. Uh, Carla was a great uh, tutor on uh, on how to write effective pitches to the Hill. I spent some time on the Hill. I spent a lot of time at the White House. It was just all-consuming job for a 30-year-old to uh, to take on. And I, but I learned a huge amount. And I, particularly, I learned that uh, affordable housing was my was going to be my niche in life, or I thought it was anyway. And, uh, as it turned out to be. Uh, I, I then went to uh, Latham and Watkins and helped open the, the Latham and Watkins Washington office. There were seven of us that uh, kind of were the pioneers, and uh, uh, and so I developed a bunch of private practice experience, including learning a lot about project finance, uh, which turned out to be helpful to me later as well. Uh, again, serendipitously, uh, I pretty early on learned that I wasn't at all interested in trial work and <coughs> only mildly interested in litigation. Uh, you know, as a field, and found myself uh, really engaged and you know, sort of waking up in the, you know, the question is, when you, when you wake up in the morning, are you motivated or aren't you? I wasn't terribly motivated around the litigation work I was doing, and uh, I loved putting together joint ventures and, and you know, forming co-creation groups and so on of one kind or another, and so I, I basically migrated in that, in that direction. I stayed, I kept my foot in the, in the housing world by uh, being the treasurer of something called the Low Income Housing Coalition. So I was able to keep my interest going, but not uh, find myself uh, knocking on the doors of the people that I effectively had supervised at HUD. So I stayed away from, I stayed away from the place for seven or eight years, but stayed in the housing field. Uh, and then, um, you know, became, began to represent some nonprofit developers, uh, substantial ones, uh, and we started to do some financing. And we worked on the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which was created in 1986. Spent a lot of time on the Hill, and then decided to form a, a consortium to raise capital for nonprofit affordable housing. And 
that's now uh, produced a billion and a half or so of capital. You know, over time, still still exists. It's still uh, um, you know I'm still contributing to the field, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, then um, I began doing policy work again, including at HUD, and and found that uh, I could solve problems. I get waivers. I could, I could deal with the issues that were stopping a particular property from being built or operated effectively or recapitalized. But that's all. That's as far as it went. I mean, it was very um, deal specific, and you know, there are millions of units of, of uh, subsidized low income housing around the country, and here we were dealing with a hundred of them. And, you know, and, and then the, the there was no no follow up. So. So I decided that I had uh, practiced law long enough and it was time to do something else. So I uh, pulled together a bunch of nonprofits and created an umbrella group called Stewards of Affordable Housing, um, which is now has a dozen nonprofit members and about 140,000 uh, affordable properties in 49 states. Uh, so it's you know it's it's really scaled, and it had the with support from the MacArthur Foundation. And Kresge Foundation and some others, we were able to really build policy, a policy machine and, and able to get uh, some substantial changes that affected the financeability and operations of uh, low-income housing projects around the country. And we also were able to raise some additional capital and so a lot of different, there were a lot of different steps in it, but uh, it it's, uh, started in 2003. I stepped down five years ago from running it and now I'm their strategic advisor. Which means I do what I darn well please when I want to. It's a good role, right? Um, so, uh, so that's kind of been my serendipitous journey, and I, that we, we were expecting a lot of students here, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, we compliment those who came. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it reflects my view that. You, you plunge into things, you find something of interest to you, you plunge into it, and then you uh, uh, go with the flow. You, you're not, uh, as I think uh, Richard last night said, the judge had no game plan. Uh, you know, his game plan evolved over time as, as he had different experiences and opportunities, and he seized the opportunities and, and ran with them. So uh, that's kind of the way I see my own, my own history here. Um, I should add that my, uh, my closest collaborator at SAFE, which is what we call our housing group, the guy named Rick Sampson, who was a member of the class of 75 at this law school. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, our, our best policy advocate and, and analyst and writer is sitting in the back row back here. Uh, that's Adam Cohen. A Adam just came from, from working with uh, SAVE for two years, doing uh, policy work on the Hill and, and, the, and the agencies and so on, uh, and is here as an as a, uh, environmental justice fellow. As a first year of law student, so please raise your hand back. <laughs> so, with that, I'll turn this over to uh, yeah. Well, it is great to be here. Um, speaking about having no plan or path, um, I'd say that my professional life kind of epitomizes that um, as I moved from one passion to the next to the next. And I, um, I know that when I, it took me a while to get to law school. It was absolutely not on my career path. Um, when I graduated from college, I thought that I wanted to do um, uh, mental health work. And I should say that part of the reason I think why law school was eliminated for me was that my four years of college and even after, I worked as a law librarian in, um, at Harvard Law School, and there was nothing like being on the other side of the desk to make you not want to go to the law um, So I then went off and did some child mental health work and had an epiphany one day that, um, that we were working with all these kids and they were going back to homes that were really in disarray and environments that were unsafe and that I needed to be part of the bigger picture solution. And it had been long enough since I'd been um, working at the law school, and I realized as long maybe as I didn't go to Harvard Law School, <laughs> I didn't go to Harvard Law School, just being honest here. Uh, 
<laughs> and ended up applying kind of on a whim to NYU, going to law school there. And at, in those days, I was an older student. Um, now everyone's an older student. Um, but we were a small cohort of older students. And I had an idea. And that idea was that I was going to follow this passion and in my in my thinking it really was this idea of doing legal services work but I had no idea what that was um, and so I was a Ruth Tilden at NYU which is a public interest fellowship which gave me the opportunity to do some internships at lots of different organizations um, and I will never forget that the summer of my first year of law school, I applied to work at the Legal Aid Society doing legal services work up in Harlem. And I got that job, and I got a job at the NYCLU doing civil liberties work, and I also got a job offer at um, the Attorney General's office working in the Civil Rights Bureau. And I went to the legal services, um, the head of the legal services office, who in those days the head of the office was interviewing me, which I now know would never happen. Um, and I said, well, I'm not going to do this because I know what this is and I need to figure out what I, I need to eliminate things from what I want to do. And she said, well, could you just maybe come and see if you actually like this? So I did. Um, uh, footnote, the next job I had once I finally left Legal Aid was overseeing the Civil Rights Bureau at the Attorney General's <laughs> office. So my imagination and my creativity was pretty narrow. <laughs> um, so I, I, I fell in love with working at Legal Aid. It just completely struck the right chord. And when I speak to um, young people all the time, I just say, look, you've got to find what strikes that chord for you. Um, and I also say, and if, if making money is the thing that makes you happy, great, and give to places like the Legal Aid. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, there are lots of ways of feeling fulfilled. And for me, um, the sort of arcane legal thinking in the abstract was not that interesting. But those same issues, when grounded with a client who I cared passionately about, were completely fascinating. And I needed that very concrete experience to make my mind engage. And that has always been the case. So I started at Legal Aid in the, right after my clerkship. Um, uh, had lots of conversations with the judge about it, but I'll sort of save that for the next round of discussion. Um, and it was amazing. It was wonderful. I was a generalist. I was in court, um, in housing, and consumer issues. Had crazy things happening every day. I loved the chaos of it. I loved the problem solving of it. I loved the talking to my clients. Um, I just loved it. And um, I can. But what I discovered looking back, I didn't experience it at the time was that looking back, every few years, I feel like I kind of got it under control. And when it was too under control, it was time to take on a new challenge. <laughs> and um, so I think the theme here is that I kind of like messes. Um, and so I, I kept doing different things at Legal Aid. And um, you know, I, part of that was sometimes breaking the rules. Um, because you know organizations have structure and the hierarchy and it's like well if you kind of push it here and you push it there you create new opportunities and so as long as you're doing it and you're accountable and you report up i think a little bit of being flexible with rules is an important thing um, and so i did i i then started to do law reform work um, at the legal aid society working on disability and health issues and establish myself as kind of a a known quantity was getting phone calls across the country on these kinds of issues. I um, I then wanted to run an office. I was feeling a little bit um, frustrated by the the way in which law reform cases would just go on forever and ever and ever. And that was I wanted to do more. I wanted I was finding litigation big litigation to be um, sometimes more of a burden than a plus. Um, and so I took on running one of our neighborhood offices, and that was really fun. And I discovered there that um, 
unlike a lot of lawyers, management came easy to me. So there was a lot of opportunity to become a manager and a lawyer. Um, I, I like to say that lawyers often go into the business of being lawyers just so that they don't really have to engage on interpersonal things. <laughs> um, you know, you have you have a vocabulary, you have a you have a dialogue with your clients that is not about how are you feeling today and what are your professional aspirations or you're really not doing a great job, right? And um, so I discovered that I enjoyed both pieces of this a lot and started to run some offices. And then for the only crazy reasons that could happen at the Legal Aid Society, I should have said in New York City, um, I was asked to run the immigration unit because no, we needed someone to run the immigration unit. I knew nothing about immigration. I was, we've created a health law unit. I was running a neighborhood office. And I said, sure, I'll do it for like a little bit. And then I was doing it for more than a little bit. And I still knew nothing about, not very much about immigration law. And then I said, look, I can't actually be, this is, this is even too much for me. Um, so I should just go back to my old job. And it was a really interesting moment when one of my um, colleagues at Legal Aid who likes to think of himself as my boss, but I never thought of him that way. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, said I. You know, said I think you are loving this immigration, and what about just going for it and doing it? And I tell this story because it's really important that there was this moment where I walked away from who I was professionally, and it was terrifying and exhilarating. And I was again a nobody in immigration. No one knew me. I was walking in and overseeing a unit of phenomenally skilled lawyers who were steeped in some of the most complex issues in immigration law, the criminal immigration intersection, which now people hear about. No one talked about it then. Um, and here I was, like, who, how could I bring value? What could I do? And it turned out that I had a whole bunch of skills from all my federal litigation, from all my, my um, sort of advocacy work that I'd done that they didn't have, and, that, and my management ability. And so I said, OK. And I took over running the immigration unit for five years. And within about a year and a half, I was getting phone calls from across the country. I was able to put our immigration unit on the map. They were going to trainings. They they were pretty excited and transformed. They were I was trying to stretch them in all different ways than they had done before, and it was fabulous. So then the next crisis happened at Legal Aid um, in um, 19 in uh, 2004, I guess it was um, before the financial crisis. Legal Aid um, almost went into bankruptcy because of how it had been managed before, and I thought, and I was really upset about it, and I felt like I had an obligation to this institution that I loved, that we had an obligation, the people who were there who loved the institution, to make sure that never, ever happened again. And so I became the general counsel, also with people saying to me, well, this is, if I still have a minute, this is a slightly funny story because I was asked to be general counsel, and. I thought, um, no, like no one at Legal Aid knew what a general counsel did. <laughs> so I thought that someone was telling me, like, we're we're retiring you. This is what's and I was like, got really mad. Actually, at the same person who wasn't my boss. <laughs> you don't even know what it is. He said, No, I, they're telling me. All the law firms, the board, they're telling me it's an important position. <laughs> it was hysterical. So I took the job and became general counsel, and he and I then ran Legal Aid and really put it into good financial stead. And five years after that, I was thinking, and this is a judge inspiration, that I just needed to, I needed to know if I could fly. I felt like a big fish in a small pond. And I really had no idea if I could, what it would be like to be in the bigger world where I hadn't grown up. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And, and the 
But there was a new New York State Attorney General who'd just been elected, who I only vaguely knew, and his search team kept coming to me asking me if I was interested in working for the state. And my answer was, hell no, I sued the state. Um, I, don't, I don't work for the state. But then they, you know, we talked and they, they, they persevered and they said, come in and talk. And, um, you know, I realized that it was actually an amazing opportunity to be able to bring affirmative litigation and do enforcement work with power in a way that I never had before and to do it judiciously with power, to be professional and thoughtful and careful. So I went to the New York State Attorney General's office, oversaw the Civil Rights Bureau, the Charities Bureau, Environmental Protection, Labor, and all the great work that we did, um, and then kept getting promoted in that again because of those management skills, and it turns out that there were a whole bunch of really great lawyers who had no idea how to run an organization. Um, so by the end of my eight years at the AG's office, I worked under Eric Schneiderman. Um, some of you may know about his implosion. And then under Barbara Underwood, uh, where we just had a blast. Um, and then I was had to look for another job, also really now for the first time actually putting a resume together when the Legal Aid Society came back and said, would I come, and they were kind of in a crisis, and would I think about being the head of the Legal Aid Society? Which was, frankly, another terrifying step for me. I've never been the face of an organization before. So I, and because of everything that was going on at Legal Aid, it was also a really, um, it fit my criteria, which is that I want to keep challenging myself and I want to keep growing and I want to keep life a little messy so that there's there's work to clean up. Um, so I probably talked more than I should have, but anyway. Right. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out today to a closed building. Um, thanks to the University of Maine Law School for pulling this all together when the institution is closed. Um, I feel super humbled to be included on this panel, listening to Bill um, and to Janet speak and knowing all of the incredibly distinguished um, academics and practitioners in this audience. So I just really want to emphasize that like, we're just here as examples, <laughs> examples of the judge's legacy. Um, so I grew up um, in uh, a working class family on Chicago's Northwest Side. My dad was a plumbing laborer and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And they had four children, four daughters, and um, really believed in the American dream, the idea that education could be a path to the future and kind of raised us to think um, we're going to have to imagine our futures, but we can be whatever we want to be. So when I was 10, I joined a swim team because it was free and could ride your bike there. <laughs> and then my parents only had one car and my dad took it to work. Um, and I loved it so much, more than anything. I loved my teammates. I loved that I could get there myself. I loved how fair it was. Like you swim really hard and whoever touches the wall that's a winner. It's determined by a clock. And, um, and I loved my coach. I admired my coach. Um, and so when I was in fifth grade, we had to write a paper about what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I wrote that I wanted to be a swim coach. There was no path then to be a professional swimmer, which there is now, by the way. Um, but I really admired my coach. And um, I had a book called The Science of Swimming, written by um, Doc Councilman, who was the coach um, at the University of Indiana, which was then the swimming powerhouse of the country. <laughs> And it was like the Bible for stroke technique. And I was told these were the people I admired. And I thought, like, well, I, if I grew up and I could help people do that and give people that joy and skill, that'd be really great. And then when I was 12, my best friend, Marsha, gave me a book to read that wasn't assigned by our teachers. And she said, you have to read this book because I want to talk to you about it. And it was Harper Lee's To Kill Mockingbird. Um, now today, that book would be Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. But then it was To Kill Mockingbird. And it totally shook my world. Um, so I grew up in a part of Chicago that was uh, virtually all white, and when I was in grammar school, my parents moved to the abutting suburb called Park Ridge, which is where Hillary Clinton grew up 10 years before me. Um, but I will say that it was um, all white. My dad was the only Jew I knew, um, and 
uh, our representative was Henry Hyde, and it was all Republican, and that's, you know, the happy little enclave I was growing up in, and I didn't know anything about racism, and even though we were like the poorest people in our town, I wanted for nothing, so I didn't know anything about poverty, and the idea that because of racism and poverty, a person could be wrongly convicted of a crime they didn't commit kind of shook me to my core. The idea that these institutions that we think of are fair, on the surface look fair, are totally unfair because of the impact of economic inequality and race discrimination. And I was horrified that that could happen. Um, so that was like the worst thing that I'd ever read about or heard about at that point in my life. And I also learned from that book that there was a, a job you could do where you could do something about that called being a criminal defense lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers, and I didn't know any criminal defense lawyers, and in fact, I didn't even meet any criminal defense lawyers until after I finished college. Um, you know, I went to Harvard, and there were a lot of pre-law advisors there, but they all represented businesses and institutions. I didn't meet a single pre-law advisor who represented human beings, and certainly not who represented, at that time, um, people who were uh, at risk in the criminal justice system or for whom the criminal justice system was a oppressive force. Um, that didn't happen until after I finished college. Just by luck, I applied for and got a job working for a woman named Nancy Gertner, who a few years ago was the Coffin Lecturer. Um, back then, she was in her 30s, and she was a badass female criminal defense lawyer in Boston at a time where there were very few female criminal defense lawyers. And her practice was criminal defense and employment discrimination and civil rights litigation. And, and I just felt like, okay, now this is who I want to grow up to be. This is what I want to do. And she said, well, why don't you go to law school and come back and work for me? And that's essentially um, what I did um, after having the great opportunity to clerk for Judge Coffin and then for Sandra Day O'Connor um, in the Supreme Court. Um, now, in the years that followed, I had different educational opportunities and different jobs. Um, as Janet and Bill are talking about, you know, sometimes it was the, the job I sought, and sometimes it was I didn't get the job I sought, I got some other job, or sometimes it was the right combination between the job I sought and the place I needed to be and my family responsibilities um, and so on. Um, but be that as it may, fast forward to now, the job that I have is something that I think that 12-year-old version of me in the early 70s would have thought, that's a cool job. Um, so I'm a clinical law professor at Boston College Law School. And those of you that, does anyone hear from the main clinics? <laughs> um, so, so you know, and anybody who has taken a clinic knows that actually being a clinical law professor is a lot like being a swim coach. <laughs> that, um, you get to work with incredible young people who are super committed to doing something really good, um, and you help them develop an ever-growing set of professional skills and competencies. And of course, listening to uh, Bill and Janet, you see how those competencies shift over time and over their career. And now, in law school, um, I think people have a much richer understanding than they did certainly when I was in law school about what types of skills and competency it takes to be an effective lawyer and to be able to make the changes and pivots that lawyers make in their careers. You know, of course, the traditional litigation skills and being able to um, counsel clients and negotiate and so on, but also um, the essential skill of being able to collaborate and work as part, part of the team um, and cultural intelligence, you know, in an ever increasing, um, but not fast enough, um, diverse legal workforce. Um, and, you know, I get to watch my students you know, grow up and become elected officials, elected district attorneys, um, you know, high-ranking people in public defender agencies, um, and successful lawyers in private firms. And I feel all the pride that probably the swim coach of Olympians feel <laughs> um, seeing them fly and do incredible things with their with their skills. The context in which I am teaching now, and I, in my, I'm in my 25th year as a law professor at PC, it coincides, not coincidentally, with the birth of my first child, thinking about how can I stay in the field of criminal law but not have to go to the police station in the middle of the night. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and how can I balance, how can I have more control over my own time in terms of trying to practice at the highest level of my profession, but also being present for my um, husband and family and community. So I feel very fortunate to have um, gotten a job as, as a law professor. And for all of us, I'll, I, I will say that among the other amazing impacts the judge has had on our life, the credential of having been the judge's clerk, I'm sure opened many open doors for many of us. Um, so I've taught different courses, criminal law, constitutional law, for a decade, I taught a criminal defense trial clinic where my students were essentially public defenders in the Boston Municipal Court. Um, but I've been very fortunate to be given the freedom to develop a program um, over the last, let's say, eight years um, that I call the Boston College Innocence Program. And it's an integrated academic and clinical program, the focus of which is wrongful convictions. Um, so that includes, I teach a course that's truly interdisciplinary on wrongful convictions. Some of the courses I teach with the chair of the BC Psych Department, Elizabeth Kensinger, who's an expert in um, perception and memory science. Um, the materials in the course, we read a few cases, but not too many cases. Most of the materials are um, psychology and social science and some of the um, forensic disciplines because to figure out the causes of wrongful convictions, you have to go way beyond the law. Um, and to figure out how to change the law and change legal actors, that too starts in other disciplines, um, including um, not only the social sciences, but also the art. So anybody who has seen the Netflix series Making Murder or listened to the podcast Serial um, will know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you, you might, you should watch those because all of the upcoming generations of students have watched those. So high school students are listening to the podcast serial, watching Making a Murderer, or the Netflix series when they see us about the exonerated five that used to be called the Central Park Five. Um, and they are coming to college and law school wanting to do something about the injustice of wrongful convictions. So there's this course, and then there is a clinic, a legal clinic, where um, together with a staff attorney and law students, and um, we have a graduate social work student placed in our clinic, and um, PhD psychology students who collaborate with our clinic, and undergraduate interns and fellows, a big team, um, we represent men and women uh, wrongly convicted in Massachusetts for crimes they didn't commit. Um, and so we, um, I thought that there was a serious need for this clinic because at the trial level, because we have a constitutional right to counsel, indigent people are afforded an appointed attorney and that attorney can make a motion for funds for an investigator or for experts to put on the defense. I mean, of course, criminal defense um, uh, agencies across the country are stretched for resources, so they don't have enough of that, but they do have that. But the way it works in the United States is once you are convicted of a crime and your conviction is affirmed on appeal, your conviction is considered final. And of course, there's no more presumption of innocence and no more right to counsel and no right to any funding at all to either an investigator or forensic experts who could prove that you are innocent. Um, and so I thought that there was a serious need for this and partnered with the public defender agency to create a clinic where this is what we do. We investigate, we don't take cases where the exoneration could be based on DNA alone. So you've heard about those cases, right? Um, we take cases where um, there's gonna be more work involved to have to prove innocence. So we reinvestigate the case. We find um, evidence to prove that our clients are innocent. Um, sometimes we find that the basis of their conviction was testimony that purported to be scientific, but turns out to be junk science, like a claim of an FBI agent that I compared the hair on the victim's bed to the hair on the defendant's head, and I can tell you they're identical, right? So now we know the FBI has conceded that's humanly impossible, right? That's not a science, it's not an art, it's nothing, it's just junk. Um, and so now all around the country, there's a re-examination of cases where hair microscopy testimony was the basis of the wrongful conviction. Um, or for example, arson signs, right? It used to be that there would be people within law enforcement agencies that would be like the fire whisperers, you know? And they would be like, I entered the building and there was charring over here. And from that I could tell that, you know, this fire was 
you know, started by an incendiary device or Molotov cocktails or whatever it was. Um, and now there is a, a more serious science um, studying the cause and origins of fires. And so a lot of the testimony that was given in those cases is now known to be junk, absolutely scientifically disproven. Um, there, is, there are a lot of the comparison sciences, whether it be um, bite mark or um, you know, footprint or whatever they are, um, you know, it is now understood that those are not science. They might be one day, but they're not now. Because what distinguishes DNA, for example, from these more subjective um, uh, comparison testimonies is that there is a database. You know, so first of all, there is research. The research is in peer-reviewed journals. Um, then there is a database and an ability to test for errors. Right? So you might ask one of these uh, comparison forensic experts, you know, they would say, I've testified in like a thousand cases, you know, and I've, you know, this is for sure a match, but they, they couldn't tell you how many times they were wrong because there was never any testing to see whether they were wrong. So the forensic disciplines are, are big. And also in the course of the investigation, sadly, we discover police and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, situations where the evidence of innocence was known all along to the law enforcement team and it was hidden from the defense. Um, um, more common, though, are situations just involving cognitive bias. So unconscious bias, where you, the police or prosecutor think they know who did it, they think they have a, su a suspect, and then unconsciously are suggesting that to people down the investigative road, whether it's the eyewitness, come on in, we found the suspect, we just need you to identify him, right? So we now know that that's not what you're supposed to do with respect to lineups because the actual perpetrator might not even be there or the eyewitness would be unable to identify anybody who wanted them. That was not seen as evidence of innocence, but just some inability of that victim, some failure by that victim to find the right person who was in the lineup. Um, um, so in any event, we, we, do, we, we do investigation and research along those lines, and then um, we try to persuade the district attorney's office, especially if there is a conviction integrity unit. Um, that justice was not done and to vacate the conviction. Um, we have a couple cases pending now in the conviction integrity units that I'm cautiously optimistic about. And when that fails, uh, we litigate and try to get our clients freed and exonerated. Um, so that's long work, hard work, involves uh, a lot of collaboration and teamwork, a lot of multidisciplinary expertise, uh, but it's, it's super exciting. Um, and then, um, Every student in my clinic is also working under my supervision on a law or policy reform. So in addition to seeking justice on behalf of individual clients, we're working to bring about um, changes in the law and changes in the way um, professionals in the criminal system practice to try to reduce the risk of wrongful convictions and to do a better job of identifying and remedying them when they occur. So for example, um, I serve on a standing committee created by the Massachusetts Supreme Court originally to focus on the problem of mistaken eyewitness identification because in the first set of DNA exonerations, which were mostly rape cases, in 76% of the time when you went back to say how did this innocent person get wrongly convicted, um, one of the factors in the case was mistaken eyewitness um, identification. So how does that happen and why does that happen? The answers to that are not in the law, they're in memory science, the science about perception and memory. Um, and so as part of that committee and working with law students and PhD grad students in the memory lab, um, we were able to do research that helped the work of that committee and ultimately the committees um, recommended and the Massachusetts Supreme Court approved a new set of jury instructions to be given in every case involving eyewitness identification testimony. And what we're doing now in that committee is that we've realized that everything we learned about the science of memory and perception makes us realize that there are a lot of things that happen in the system way outside of the area of eyewitness identification that are, are need to be changed or reformed in light of memory science. So for example, how could, juror, how could jurors remember instructions of law if they are not given to them in writing? Um, because you know, we forget half of what we heard within an hour. So how would anybody remember those? That's something that's just now in the discretion of judges around the country, should it be? Um, or all sorts of instructions that are given to jurors about how to assess the credibility of witnesses um, based on whether they testify inconsistently or not, 
Well, now, based on things we know about memory and perception science, we think some of those instructions that are given to juries are wrong. So we're going back and looking at all of the model jury instructions in Massachusetts to see um, whether they are correct or incorrect <laughs> based on what we know about um, accepted principles of memory science. Um, we work on legislative reform, so I have the master of this in the room, Kai Feldblum, whose legislation clinic at Georgetown really is you know, one of the first in the national model for how to do this, but my students and I draft and advocate for um, law, uh, new legislation that would address um, some of the causes of wrongful convictions or compensate or provide immediate transitional assistance to the wrongly convicted when they're released from prison after 20 years of wrongful conviction. Um, and we're working with a statewide uh, working group of um, prosecutors and defense lawyers and members of the Mass Bar to create uh, best practices for conviction integrity units that could be implemented in prosecution offices all around the state and best practices for training um, to prevent wrongful convictions. Um, so that's the gist of it. And thank you. <laughs> wow. That was uh, really very impressive uh, presentations. Let me just start by echoing Sharon that um, I'm uh, humbled and actually slightly embarrassed to be uh, held up as one of um, the judges. Uh, law clerks hardly one of the foremost and illustrative, but like just looking around the room, there's so many others, uh, much more so, but maybe a sample is a good, is a good uh, way to think about it. Um, I also note that we're terribly over on time, so I'm going to be super brief, and hopefully um, there'll be plenty of time to uh, have interactive uh, conversations as we go. Um, so uh, I'm going to start, uh, when I started law school, I was an incoming uh, public interest law fellow, an Ed Sparer uh, uh, law fellow, uh, who was a pioneer in uh, poverty law, um, uh, like the Brooklyn Law School equivalent to, to Ruth Children or, or to some of the other fellowships. That was such a critically important thing for me. Um, I loved the, the prayer that you quoted the judge having written. Uh, God grant me the, the um, strength to persevere in my commitment right now to doing you know, good and not letting personal considerations uh, get in the way. Uh, we were just chatting about this before. I think that um, an incredibly high percentage of law students feel that way, right? To go into the law to acquire an additional tool to use for social justice. Um, and yet an incredibly high percentage of them don't end up uh, doing that. And for me, um, immediately being part of this network uh, with professors like uh, Liz Schneider, um, Susan Herman, I could, I could take off a lot of the great uh, committee at, at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, it just reinforced that this was appropriate to do, that this was um, cool and important to do. Um, so much so that I was um, somewhat appalled there were only two of us as incoming uh, Ed Sparrow Fellows. So, uh, as a first year law student, I co-founded Brooklyn Law Students for the Public Interest, which then greatly expanded the number of fellowships. And we were just chatting, I was so excited to hear that Melissa uh, was also at Brooklyn Law School uh, alum. And God, it must be fellowship to go work at Pine Tree Legal Services, so that's awesome. Um, because that's the key thing, to have a, a identification that this is important work, that it, you're able to sustain yourself over time. Uh, by, by seeing yourself as, as part of that group. Um, so uh, clerking for the judge, and I'll get back to this the second round, just so solidified that and, and concretized that uh, and expanded the network with the Coffin Clever um, of people committed to that. Um, after uh, my clerkship, I um, pretty much had a coin toss between staying here in Maine and working for a great plaintiff side um, civil rights uh, law firm or going down to big city, Washington, D.C., and working for Bret Hoff and Kaiser, which is a great union side uh, labor law firm. And um, I chose the latter. I'm still wistful about, oh, maybe I could have stayed here. And, uh, but uh, the path not taken, I suppose. Um, Bret Hoff was an incredible experience for three years for me as a, as a litigator. Um, had the opportunity to work on some uh, really important cases and learned a ton about um, uh, litigating and, and being a lawyer and fighting for uh, labor unions and individual employees. 
um, was on the brief on one Supreme Court case that we lost 5-4. Um, but it's a great story because uh, we, were, we were representing the AFL in a uh, case called Prince versus uh, United States, uh, which was a, a states rights and separation of power case. And um, the Federation was concerned that if the court took a sweeping view uh, that a gun control measure that was under review uh, was unconstitutional, it could, it could remove the uh, legal underpinnings for federal regulation of states and local jurisdictions on a range of different matters. States as employers, federal law, EDSC law, you know, FLSA law, uh, you know, et cetera, maybe couldn't apply because if, if there would be an overly sweeping decision. Um, so in that case, uh, two sheriffs uh, had brought a challenge to the first phase of a gun control law, which until they got a national database up and running, the law required when you purchase a firearm, uh, a 24-hour, 48-hour waiting period, and the, the purchaser would call the local law enforcement, excuse me, the seller would call the local uh, law, uh, law enforcement uh, officer and, and, and ask that officer to run the name of the would-be purchaser through a database um, until there was a national database uh, later on developed, at which point the, um, the seller could just do it directly right, right then and there. But as an interim measure, it relied on local law enforcement. So these two local sheriffs said, no, federal government, you can't conscript, conscript us to do a federal um, a job like that. Our responsibilities are to Maricopa County or you know, wherever the local locality was. Um, so we lost 5-4. The, the, the great um, point of the story is that that decision now, which at the time uh, in, in progressive legal circles was a great loss and we were really worried and concerned. It wasn't as sweeping as it could have been, but still it was very troubling. That case is now the lead case cited by the sanctuary cities uh, movement for to, to, to stop ICE from conscripting and all the arguments. <laughs> we're responsive to lo to our local community. We get to set our local law enforcement party. All the arguments we were so worried about, it came back. So it's a great example of how the law works, and you have to be focused on the principles, not just the the lineup of of, 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 the, of the individual litigants. Um, anyway, I had always been interested in international. Uh, uh, development and the opportunity came uh, to me to become Associate General Counsel of the Peace Corps. Um, and I told people I was leaving the law firm to go work for the Peace Corps. Are you going to Kenya or are you going to, <laughs> <laughs> going to K Street? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a great experience. Um, I could tell a lot of stories about uh, my work there. Uh, one is that uh, the Peace Corps has an interesting legal relationship vis-a-vis -vis its uh, volunteers. It's a quasi-employment relationship um, because Peace Corps, you know, um, selects or, or doesn't select applicants to be go to, to go become a Peace Corps volunteer. Pays them on a, a stipend, not a salary, but still pays them. Uh, if you kick them out, it violates the rules. So you see, there's a lot of attributes of employment, but simultaneously, there's a healthcare provider-patient relationship um, because you have to go see your Peace Corps medical officer while you're in the field. Um, so there's lots of, and, and one of my internal clients was the Office of Medical Services. And I came in, looking high, uh, a month after the Peace Corps had lost an important Rehab Act decision, uh, Leslie Mendez versus Mark Guerin, then the, the Peace Corps director um, in, the, uh, in the Clinton administration. And um, so I was the lucky lawyer, young whippersnapper, to be assigned to work with the doctors in the Office of Medical Services to tell them, yeah, we need to completely redo the entire medical screening and you wanted to err on the side of safety but you can't err on the side of safety uh, you can't err on the side of legal safety or you can't err on the side of medical safety you just have to get it right every time so, <laughs> um, so the elder surgeons love being told by a young lawyer you know that they have to do that so that was uh, very interesting uh, I did a stint for uh, two years in the Justice Department Office of the Inspector General uh, which is a really important um, function to understand the oversight function, um, how that works, and um, uh, uh, it certainly helps now that I'm no longer doing that. The fact that I have done that, representing entities to a variety of different oversight uh, bodies, the fact that I, that I, that I um, was in that position. Um, one of the things I did when I was in that uh, role 
uh, as, as Marty knows, he was at Justice before, and then I think came back afterwards, was rewrapping the investigation of the FBI's role uh, in the whole detention and interrogation of the commission. So um, there was a Freedom of Information Act request, and the FBI produced some partially redacted emails from some FBI agents who had been stationed down in Guantanamo Bay. And uh, Dick Durbin started reading them in the well of the Senate. You know, these guys have written emails. You wouldn't believe some of the nonsense going on around that down here, et cetera, because they were professional, you know, interrogators, or P PhDs in behavioral science and so forth. And that wasn't exactly, particularly the beginning of the, of the um, detentions, exactly what was going on down there. So anyway, they asked the um, Inspector General to do an investigation. So I was uh, 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 coordinating. Um, our, our review of, of all of those matters. Um, that was challenging at many levels, and I left that position to go do something a lot more pro, um, uh, proactive or, or, or constructive rather than bad oversight, which was I became senior counsel at the Nature Conservancy, um, uh, where I stood up its global uh, labor and employment practice. So um, at Peace Corps, for example, um, you enjoy uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, with regard to all of your local uh, labor and employment uh, work. Uh, you, you comply with local labor laws to the extent you want to, and that tends to be a lot, but as a private actor, you know, you have to worry about Brazilian labor law, and Chinese labor law, and Indonesian labor law, and so forth. So these uh, uh, big uh, uh, multinational um, uh, NGOs, um, it wasn't just as easy as going global and sending your officers overseas to go do conservation in Brazil. You had to worry about all of that stuff. So I, I helped establish all of those um, processes. Um, at the end of that, I actually grew a little bit uh, disenchanted with being a lawyer. And I, and I um, took a, a couple of years off, and I ran the DC office of a great national nonprofit called Playworks, which partners with low-income elementary schools to use play and sports and, recess and physical activities as a space in which to model and instill a range of different social uh, and, and self-control self, uh, self uh, skills. Um, this was at a point in time when my son was um, in elementary school, and we'd have conversations after school, like, hey, Toby, how was school today? Good. <laughs> oh, and, um, and what'd you do all day? You know, nothing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, well, how was uh, how was recess? Oh well, John was on my team for kickball, and it was three two, and oh my God, so all right. Well, I have to explain this whole thing to you now. But, and so that's where he lived, right? Like emotionally, he had some agency over that little time in his day, as opposed to being told things all the all the rest of the day. So I got that, and that's a, a, a kernel of, of what animates the, the federal sector. Um, that was awesome. I, I, I never worked harder as a lawyer than I did trying to run that organization in DC. Um, but then when my uh, current position came uh, available to me, I, I decided I was ready to refresh and ready to go back to being a lawyer. And having been the executive director of an organization where you get legal advice, and then you get communications advice, and HR advice, and budget advice, they all leave, and then the door closes, and you're responsible for you know organizational results. <laughs> so I feel like then when I went back to being general counsel, it made me a lot better to uh, as general counsel to um, understand what would happen to my advice after I left the room to try to position it to be even more you know um, uh, business oriented, common sense oriented, actionable than uh, sort of a modified law review exam where I would. Say, <laughs> Brilliantly spot all the issues and brilliantly identify, you know, which in law school that's what we're trained to do, right? The more problems you find, the better grade you get. <laughs> so in the real world, that is not helpful. <laughs> uh, risk assessment, risk mitigation, these are skills that we should teach more in law school. Um, and to uh, put an addendum to the little bio in, in the uh, uh, program. After eight years at the Inter-American Foundation, where I've been general counsel, a small federal agency that does wonderful work uh, funding uh, the projects designed, thought up and designed and implemented by poor communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, shh, don't tell them that we're taking your taxpayer money's money and giving it to poor people in Latin America. <laughs> so not many people know of us. Um, but after eight years of doing that, I'm actually, I've just um, accepted a new position as general counsel of a wonderful international public health, uh, uh, global public 
Health Organization, headquartered both, both in Boston and in Arlington, called Management Sciences for Health. So I'm starting that by Monday. Um, wow. so, um, uh, I'm going to leave it there to try to save some more time for my colleagues. So, uh, happy to be here. I have to chuckle because all the prior panels have gotten up here and said, I'm so humble. Well, let me tell you, I'm so humble. <laughs> it is such an honor to be invited to this panel to um, talk about my short career. <laughs> but I will get right to it because you've all come here apparently so interested about that. So I, I grew up in Latin America, um, which at least when I lived there and last I checked a few years ago was the most unequal region in the world. It's a region where the richest 10 per the, the richest 10 percent of people control 70 percent of the region's wealth. And in this world of extremes, my parents were incredibly committed to uh, make me be aware of the privilege that we had and to pay it forward and to really give back to the community. And they took this call to action very seriously. <laughs> so seriously that by the time I was 18 and applying to college, I had accumulated a very uncool number of community service hours. Yeah. Highly uncool. <laughs> but my uncoolness paid off because um, when I applied to, to go to school at NYU, I was awarded the Martin Luther King Junior Scholarship. And this was a scholarship that was uh, provided to students who you know, were committed to public service and to community service and wanted to make a change. And I was feeling pretty good about myself and stuff until I met my fellow scholars, and they hugely humbled me um, and changed my life and changed my, my career, uh, my, my trajectory. Uh, I, I got to spend four years with some incredibly motivated young people who had done incredible things in their very short lives. And it made me want to do more. Um, it made me feel like I could do more and that I needed to do more. And so over the next seven years, first in college and then in law school, I seized opportunities to work at organizations that existed solely to improve the lives of others. That was their mission. And so with that in mind, I worked at an immigration advocacy in Homestead, Florida that worked um, called Centro Campesino that uh, was dedicated to providing services to migrant farm workers. I um, served as an on-call Spanish interpreter for um, the legal department at the door, which was uh, a really, really great nonprofit in New York City that uh, served urban youth. I worked at the Legal Aid Society in the Immigration Law Unit, which was the mothership of immigration law, and at the time completely blew my mind. I absolutely loved it. And um, I worked on their juvenile docket, helping um, juveniles uh, apply for special immigrant juvenile status, a form of immigration relief available to minors who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents. And then I worked at, um, at AYULA, another nonprofit in Washington, D.C., also um, focused on providing immigration uh, services to victims of crime, primarily. And so after graduation um, in, in Washington, D.C., I went to George Washington Law School. I, I had a plan to uh, c pursue a career in public interest in Washington, D.C. or New York City, the two cities that I had really grown to love. And then fate intervened. I took a 40-minute ferry ride, and I met an incredible human being who swept me off my feet. <laughs> this amazing human being was from Maine. <laughs> and in 40 minutes, managed to um, get me to fall madly in love with him. <laughs> and years later, that amazing human being is sitting in the room. He's now my husband. <laughs> and he persuaded me to you know, come check me out. Let's see if we can make this work. I've never been to Maine. When you need to know something important about me. I'm from Costa Rica. That means tropical blood. <laughs> Warm tropical blood pumps through my veins. <laughs> tropical blood that is not compatible with long, cold, 20 degree winters in Maine. But love is persuasive. My husband is persuasive. And I gave it a go. So having, again, never been to Maine, not having done any networking in Maine, I didn't know anyone. And so Silas called his one friend from high school who happened to be a lawyer in Maine. And this one friend from high school told us about this great little nonprofit called Pine Tree Legal Assistance. They do really cool work. You should check them out. 
So I called up the executive director, um, Nan Heald, who was very, very busy, but thankfully made the time to take my call, and quickly informed me that, nope, not really hiring, nope, the funding is terrible, um, uh, but you know, there is this fellowship, you should apply to the fellowship. Oh, by the way, the deadline to apply is, you know, Monday, this was Friday. <laughs> okay. So I started researching and researching and researching about the fellowship and that's when I first learned about Judge Coffin and I learned about his legacy, I learned about his commitment to public service, about his commitment to really not forget the, the person who can't afford an attorney and to, to create legal representation to people who need it most. And based on the work that I had done over the last seven years, that struck a chord and it, and it, it spoke to me and it felt right. And so I applied to the fellowship and I was so honored to be offered the opportunity. And so over the next two years, um, I, I worked as a Coffin Fellow um, at Pine Tree Legal Assistance. So let me tell you a little bit, some of you may already be familiar with the Coffin Fellowship, but for those of you who aren't, I'll just give you a little bit more detail. So it's a two-year program and the fellows are staggered. So they hire one mentor, at a, one, one fellow at a time so, so that there's always a mentor-mentee relationship. And that is vital because it prevents burnout. <laughs> you have a buddy who's been through it the year right before you who can, who can you know, hold your hand a little bit and tell you it's going to be okay and kind of go through it with you. And the cases um, that are assigned to the Coffin Fellows for representation are uh, family matters and also protection from abuse cases. And they are selected because they have a complicating factor, a complicating factor that makes it impossible or very difficult to refer out for promoter representation because these are going to be a time suck, a huge time suck, complicated cases. That complicating factor tends to be um, more often than not domestic violence or sexual assault. Uh, it can also be mental health and it can also be immigration issues. It can be language barriers. And that becomes your really fun caseload for two years. Um, and you are thrown in the deep end of the pool, but with floaties. That's what I've always said. So you, are, you, you start litigating right away. In fact, they swear you in earlier than the rest of, of the folks who are getting sworn in with you because they really need you in court right away the second you get there. And, um, and you, you, you go to court, and the floaties are everyone at Pine Tree Legal Assistance, your fellow staff, incredibly dedicated, passionate public interest attorneys who are doing law the right reasons who are really, really using that law degree to effectuate change, to make people's lives better, and who are experts in their craft. And they are patient and kind, and will walk you through all the cases, answer all of your questions so that you can actually go to court and not commit malpractice, <laughs> and win a few cases at the same time, and, and make a difference. So I, I did that for two years, um, and after um, my fellowship, I like to say that I, I went to do a, a pseudo clerkship with Judge O'Mara over here. <laughs> I uh, practiced at Murray Plum and Murray for some time, and, and Dick, I believe, was channeling his inner Judge Coffin because <laughs> he was um, just fabulous. I was in the civil, uh, civil litigation practice group, and um, I got to do a ton of research and writing, and you know, uh, we would talk about complicated legal issues, and he allowed me to to really grow as a writer, as a researcher, and, and to expand. Um, and I absolutely loved it, but public interest came calling again, and it's a, a pretty, pretty persuasive knock when I got a call from Pine Tree Legal. They had just received federal funding um, through the Victims of Crime Act to uh, create a, to launch a new project out of their Lewiston office to provide legal representation to the protective caregiver of a child who had been sexually abused. That was what the project had been, was, was crafted for. And they asked me if I wanted to staff this pilot project. Do you want to, can you, can you do this? And so I said, let's do it. So I did it for a year. The pilot project was a success um, and it resulted in Pine Tree Legal getting um, a lot more money to launch the same project statewide. And for the first time in the history of Pine Tree Legal, there now were attorneys in all of their offices across the street providing representation in family matters. The project expanded to not only child victims of sexual assault, um, also expanded to provide services, again, to adult victims of sexual assault and also domestic violence to extent the program had capacity. 
And again, it was the first time that someone in press file, for example, could have a high three legal assistance attorney representing them in their PFA or in their, you know, in their divorce or in their parental rights mm -hmm. case. Um, and it was incredibly rewarding, and I, and I, I loved doing it. I, I got so much out of it. Um, I got to meet some incredibly resilient human beings who had experienced some intense crimes and taught me what it's like to have strength and to move forward and to not give up and to keep pushing. And the fact that I had the privilege to represent them is something I'll never forget. Um, I then had a, a, a little girl, <laughs> so what, what you said, Professor, really <laughs> resonated with me because litigation is fabulous, but it's, it's very exciting. I loved litigating, but it's also a bit of a roller coaster, not super predictable in terms of your hours. And I really wanted to find a job that allowed me to continue in my path of public service, but I could get home and put my little girl to sleep at night and have dinner with her every day. And so um, the, the main judicial branch had an opening uh, for their family division manager. And this was an opportunity, in my opinion, to effectuate change at a macro level. It was public service to the core. Is how can we make our court system work for people that don't have the money to hire an attorney? And in family law cases, that's the vast majority of your litigants in the courts. And I had had the privilege of, you know, having these really tough cases with a lot of folks who had just prior to coming to see me had perhaps tried going through the system without an attorney and had found it very daunting, um, who had uh, really low, uh, some, I had some clients who were illiterate, some clients who had, you know, really low education levels. And I had through that time learned, you know, the importance of breaking things down and making our court forms, for example, more accessible to folks, so making um, to create, you know, creating tools for the court, uh, materials that can be provided to people that are written in plain English that can explain the court process and what to expect. And so I have been with the judicial branch now for almost a year, and um, it has allowed me to actually make some of the changes I wanted to see at a macro level when I was practicing, um, and um, also allowed me to get home and put my little girl to sleep at night. So it's, um, a, I think a nice meld of the, of the two missions and something I'm enjoying tremendously. So with that, I'll turn it to Melissa Martin. Who so I'm glad that I got to follow Caroline because there are some similarities in our story and how we um, became Coffin Fellows. I think our passion for public service. Um, it's some similarity that we share, but we come from very different backgrounds. So I grew up in Downey, Maine, in Washington County. Um, and part of the, the reason why I lived there was because my father was the game warden. So um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's um, law enforcement for hunting and fishing and recreation. Um, and so he wanted to live in kind of what he considered to be the best area to do his job, so the most rural area of Maine. <laughs> um, and so that's how I grew up, and it was a very unique upbringing. Um, and of course, I immediately wanted to get out and move to the city. <laughs> <laughs> I attended Boston University for undergraduate, um, and I studied international relations, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to work in the State Department, I studied abroad, I really wanted to go overseas. I wanted kind of this completely different life than what I had experienced growing up. Um, and then I went to a presentation my senior year um, about Teach for America and heard about this idea of education and equity, the idea that students in, in some public schools in the country get a vastly different education than those in other public schools. Um, and this really struck a chord for me because it was what I felt like I experienced growing up. Um, going from being in Washington County to, to going to Boston University with some of the most privileged students in the world, I had felt that when I attended college, um, and I felt woefully unprepared. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to apply for Teach for America, that I wanted to work on kind of poverty issues in the United States. So I applied for Teach for America, and I went to an even bigger city, so I moved to New York City. Um, and taught, I ended up teaching for four years total, so I worked for a public school for two years and then worked for an all-boys charter school for another two. And that was honestly probably 
just as good preparation for the job I do now as law school was. Um, <laughs> having to speak in front of a group of students every day, it's um, amazing how many of the strategies I use, um, is what that I was that I use teaching my eight-year-olds that I used to <laughs> help a judge pay attention to what I'm presenting when I'm litigating. <laughs> Time management, um, <laughs> client management, really similar a lot of times to what I'm doing. Do you think a judge treats them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, sometimes I find myself like, oh, they look like they're not paying attention, so I'm going to move around the courtroom. <laughs> 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 well, it's a lot of the same strategies that I've been teaching. Um, and, but after my time teaching, what I discovered was as much as I loved it in a variety of ways, I also really wanted to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so at that point, I decided, um, I, I also didn't think, I never was like, I'm going to go to law school, I want to be a lawyer, that wasn't the career path that I expected. Um, but when I got to the point of realizing that I wanted to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, I was like, okay, well, I can go to social work school or I can go to law school. Um, and I ultimately picked law school in part because I, I really wanted an experience that was going to be academically challenging, which I got. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I ended up falling in love with law school and loving studying law. And so when I um, was going to graduate, I decided um, to clerk in an appellate court. And so that was very different during my time in law school. So I also went to Brooklyn Law School. And I knew I wanted to do public interest work. So my first summer, I came back to Maine. Um, I decided at that point that Maybe I would live in Portland at some point in the future. Um, and I worked at Pine Tree Legal Assistance and had an incredible experience um, getting to intern doing litigation in domestic violence and sexual assault cases. And I thought, this is great. This is exciting. Um, you don't know what you're going to walk into every day. And, and that was an amazing experience for me. I did a domestic violence clinic in New York. I also worked at Legal Aid Society in the juvenile rights practice. Um, and so all of these experiences have been very on the ground work and I knew that's what I wanted to do long term. But I also really enjoyed the study of law. And so I applied for clerkships and ended up clerking for Justice Foreman in the Maine Supreme Court. Um, and that meant for a year I was working on appellate briefs and it was um, kind of like an extension of law school in the sense that it was very intellectual and it wasn't this sort of exciting on the ground work. Um, I didn't think that I would use that in my career as much as I have, um, but I, it's been surprising to me how much I have, and I'm going to tell a little story about that. Um, so I ended up, after my clerkship, um, applying for and getting the Kauffman Fellowship, which I had known since my time interning at Pine Tree was sort of my dream job. So I wanted to be in the courtroom litigating these complicated cases. Um, and as Caroline said, in, when you're um, working as a Coffin Fellow, you are working on the cases that are prioritizing cases that are going to be difficult for some reason. So sometimes they're difficult because the attorney on the other side is known to be particularly aggressive. Sometimes it's difficult because it's an interesting legal issue. Sometimes it's difficult because of your client. Um, your client has you know, incredible mental health needs or it's substance abuse recovery. And so, um, these are all cases, and the idea was, these are cases that are too time consuming to ask people to take as pro bono cases. So we're going to take new attorneys and have them work on these cases and put the time and effort that they require into them. Um, and I was thinking about the lecture last night, they were talking about Judge Coffin and how he um, didn't have, you know, it wasn't necessarily, I'm going to do this and then go on to this and then I have this plan for how my life is going to go. And there was this um, thought within that, I just want to do interesting and meaningful work that is, is going to be interesting for me and also meaningful to society. And, that, and I was thinking, of that, wow, that is really a perfect description of what we do as Kauffman Fellows. So our work is, it, to me, it, there's something about each case that makes it interesting for me to work on, but they're also really important cases. And um, I think it's amazing that I've gotten to work on them. So I could tell the story, and I have a lot of you know, really incredible um, stories about incredible clients and amazing times where I've been able to get a lot of money for somebody who really needed it. Um, but I wanted to tell something that's a little bit more lighthearted, um, and especially because Janet talked about how crazy kind of legal aid work is, and Paul talked about his first US Supreme Court case. So <laughs> I got my first US Supreme Court case a couple of weeks ago. And 
when you're getting mail in your law office, right, you're used to getting something that's a letter size or something that's eight and a half by 11. So when you have a package that comes in, that's this size. <laughs> and imagine a couple of these stacked. That's going to be a strange size package to receive if you don't normally do US Supreme Court litigation. And what's going to add to that is if you know the party sending it to you has pretty severe history of mental health issues um, to the point of having some pretty extreme paranoia, this is a known stalker, and, and these are the types of parties that we're working with in, at Pine Tree Legal Assistance, that's going to raise more red flags. So when we received this package, um, my paralegal said, you know, we received a suspicious package, so um, I <laughs> <laughs> she said, so I put it in my supervisor's office. <laughs> okay. And we had to decide how to deal with this. Um, and so I, I sat in my supervisor's office with her and the package for a while, and we looked at it, and she said, well, what do you want to do? And I thought, you know, I, I did sign up for it. I love the crazy aspect of my job, but opening that is, is kind of crossing a line. <laughs> you know, just on the 1% chance that there's, I don't know, a bomb in there. I don't really want to do that. And so we ultimately decided to call the police, and they said, well, this is easy, you know. <laughs> So we'll just call them and confirm that that's been done and, and that it'll be okay. Well, they called them and it hadn't been scanned. <laughs> they ended up having to bring in a robot and open the <laughs> And in my the U.S. Supreme Court brief. <laughs> so we felt a little ridiculous about it. <laughs> I still felt like it was, when I read the contents, I was like, oh, yes, okay, well, I think we made the right call based on some of the things that have been here. <laughs> be my first U.S. Supreme Court case, and it won't, it won't be as legally interesting as yours, um, but I think just the fact that there's always something new and exciting happening in my office is part of what I enjoy about my job, um, and you know, I, I can tell you a lot of meaningful stories, like I said, but I thought that one sort of highlights part of, part of what makes my job entertaining and part of the reason I'm still at my tree. Um, so just to highlight in general some of the things that I really love about my job, it's that I get to do meaningful work, um, and I feel like I have one of the few litigation jobs left in the legal field, so I'm in court multiple times a week. Um, and like Caroline said, um, we're in court right away as Coffin Fellows, so my, I, think, I think I had one person with me for my first trial. They weren't even second chairing, they were just in the courtroom. Um, and, and then that's it, and then I was by myself. And within a couple of years, people were coming and observing my trials to learn how to do trials. So um, that, that's hitting the ground running, definitely. Caroline and I actually both sought out doing some national trial skills training because we felt like, oh, we actually do a lot of trial work and we want to get better at this, and we ended up doing this incredible program um, that was trial skills training specifically for attorneys who represent domestic violence and sexual assault survivors. Um, and so that was an incredible, incredible training that we did. Um, my clients are an incredible group of people. Um, like I said, some of them have survived horrific interpersonal violence. Um, they're often parents that live in poverty. They're people in recovery. Sometimes they're formerly homeless or they're victims of sex trafficking. So they're a really incredible and inspiring group of people to work with. Um, and I get to work with them really directly. So I get to use all the skills that I learned in law school. I'm writing a lot. Um, like I kind of mentioned, I've actually gotten to do a lot of appellate work because we've realized that um, people who are abusive, when they lose their cases, are actually pretty likely to appeal. Um, and so I've gotten to do a lot of briefs to the law court in Maine, in addition to a lot of trial work, and it's great that I have that mixture. Um, I'm also negotiating and settling a lot of cases, doing a lot of um, mediations. And every day is really different. So some days I'm going to be working at home on a brief to the law court, and other days I'm going to be taking a case to trial in Bridgeton District Court with a client I met 20 minutes ago. And that variety is, is really exciting. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about what some of the other former Coffin Fellows have done besides Caroline and I. Um, and I think it's pretty telling that about half of them have stayed at Pine Tree Legal Assistance for um, part of their career, at least. Um, and some of the, many of them are still there. Um, so it's kind of incredible now that the program has been in effect for some years. There are a lot of managing attorneys at 
Pine Tree Legal Assistance who are former Coffin fellows. Um, and then there are people who have moved on to do other things. So there are, of course, some people who are in private practice. Um, and then there are some people who have done really interesting um, projects that are kind of connected. And I was thinking about this when you were talking, Sharon, about mental health and sort of the scientific research. So we have one former Coffin fellow who decided that when she was working on her fellowship, she said, we're really not doing enough for children who are traumatized by domestic violence. And so she decided to go to a project that works with therapists who provide therapy for children who have been affected by trauma. And that's been really great. It has the direct effect, of course, that we thought of initially, which is we can send our clients and families to her program to receive mental health treatment. What we didn't realize initially, and in the past couple years we've developed this, is her therapists are also really important for us because they can provide expert testimony in court about the effects of domestic violence on children. And so we started using that more, and in that we're educating and shifting the mindset of the judiciary about what is appropriate um, contact to order between an abusive parent and their child and what kind of protections need to be in place. So. I think it's so important and so amazing that in addition to the incredible therapists that she works with, that I can, when I'm preparing for a case where one of them is going to testify, I know that they also have someone in their office who have actually done my job and knows what it's like to litigate in a courtroom and can help prepare them for some of the things that are going to come up on cross-examination. Um, and so I think that that shows that even if you go to a really different um, job, you can have use this experience to really inform that. Um, and I want to give us some time to be able to answer other questions, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Now that you've met the remarkable panelists, we're going to move the podium away. We want to talk a little bit about the judge's impact and his life's impact on what they decided to do. So I'm going to, since we haven't heard from Bill since this morning, I'm going to <laughs> okay, well, let me just make a couple of uh, a couple of quick points. One, uh, I think, really came out in, in Richard's uh, lecture last night, which is that the the judge had a sense of. Uh, had an integrated personality and uh, had a real sense of uh, maintaining personal well-being. And as we're seeing across you know, all fields of social change these days, uh, this is a huge problem and a huge, and a huge opportunity um, to not only to, to have people lead um, better lives um, for themselves, but also to affect how they go about doing their, their social change uh, work. And it's, it's uh, uh, working with uh, with Paul's wife and a bunch of other people at Ashoka and uh, Esselin and a whole bunch of other groups. We're, we're, we're now trying to figure out uh, what the best strategies are for different types of people. Uh, starting we started with a group of 60 social entrepreneurs, but but in any event, it was it was really the judge and the way he handled um, being a, being a. Uh, Workhorse, but not a workaholic. To again, to quote from last night, uh, that uh, really got me focused on this, and, and has helped me uh, with my personal well-being over the course of lots of challenging, um, you know, work assignments. And and I think it's something that's really important for the field. Let me, let me just make one other point. Uh, back to the um, to again to Fisher's lecture. Um, the, the, the idea of workability that the judge um, uh, emphasized in his opinions and his thinking, I think came from a deep sense of empathy, which I think he conveyed to, you know, to all his clerks. So, so, so in order to understand and to care about how other people have to deal with the legal opinions that you render uh, or whatever else you're doing in life, uh, you've got to have enough, you've got to have empathy. And I think the judge demonstrated that and conveyed that to, to all his clerks. So true. Um, when I, there are so many lessons that I learned from the judge in ways in which he, you know, really promoted me and helped me um, think about my career. But I made reference to um, how I had many conversations with him about what I was going to do next when I left the clerkship. And, you know, the judge was, the judge, I always felt like he thought I was this odd duck because I was like crazy passionate about everything and he was always trying to kind of tame it in ways. 
but he was completely respectful of it. And he, and I feel like what he taught me was that I, that my passion should be my mission, right? That was what I had to carry forward, but that I had to do it in a professional way, <clears throat> in a thoughtful way, and with integrity. And that the clerkship experience, I, you know, when he would tell me things like, okay, so I'm listening to you talk, and what's your point, <laughs> um, so, But he would, you know, his constructive feedback on sort of how I could take all this swirling around ideas that I had and turn them into something productive was really huge. And when I talked to him about whether I should go work as, I, at the end I was deciding between whether I should become a public defender, um, at PDS in Washington, or go to the Legal Aid Society, he said, look, those are hard decisions, your passion, like you've got passion for both of them, but I'm gonna tell you that it's really, really important that you, you know, he said, well, I worked in government and government's really important and he kind of was speaking to me about the value of that, but he said, but it's, it's really important to go work for a place where you don't have power, where you don't walk into the room and you are the powerful person because you've got to appreciate what power does and you've got to recognize that day in and day out. And that was so important to, I mean, I, I took it to an extreme working 25 years at a place where I had no power <laughs> but, uh, in the law, but it was really about that humility and respect for others. And so my experience at the Attorney General's office when all of a sudden I was the, the, um, the point between people issuing subpoenas for investigations, and I would say, I would really put everyone through this this analysis and test, and we would have lots of discussions about whether a subpoena was warranted. And the prosecutors in the office, almost everyone else was a prosecutor, a former prosecutor, they'd be like, why? You know, what are you, I mean, they were good people and good prosecutors, but that process of really thinking about the weight of a subpoena and the weight of imposing on people's lives was, to me, went and came from the judge was so important to him. Um, so nobody could be the judge, right? I <laughs> know that from the lecture. But um, all the things that he modeled were so important to all of us. And also he was a phenomenal boss. So I just want to say a couple of things about that. So, you know, first of all, um, the fact that he was so true, not only to his craft, but to his family and to me, who he loves so much, and his art and the ocean. So he modeled for us that you could aspire to be whatever you want to be in your career. That doesn't mean that you can't be in the place that you love or with the people that you love and do the things that you love. That was a super important message to hear and to see somebody at the top of his legal game living that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then those things that he crafted in his own life, that he made space for in his own life, he wanted that for us. Um, and so he um, treated us, he welcomed us into his extended family. He shared with us Ruth and the Coffin children, which is amazing. Um, he, you know, I remember working on something, the most important thing I'd ever worked on, some important constitutional law decision, and I was late with it because I was slow. So I clerked with Barbara, the world's fastest, most effortless <laughs> writer, channel the judge, you know, and I'm working, working on this thing, and I'm feeling bad because the judge was expecting it, you know, the day before or something, and it wasn't done. And here I am working, working, and it's, I don't know, like five, five o'clock or something, and the judge comes out of his chambers, and I wish that wasn't happening because he's going to see me not done with this thing yet. <laughs> And he says, why are you here still? Because <laughs> I'm working on this important thing. <laughs> and he said, go home to John. You know, and this idea that, yes, lawyers, we have deadlines. Some of them are hard deadlines. Some of them are softer deadlines. And if you are a boss or a teacher that cares about your students as human beings, then you're not thinking about them as people who are doing things for you but you're thinking about their whole life. And that was super important um, for the judge, to see the judge modeling and doing that. And one other thing I want to say, and others are going to talk about this, how the, one of the hugest things the judge, judge gave us are each other, the clever, and hearing about the fellows, what you have gone on to do. 
I, you know, people talk about the judge's influence through the clerks, and I'm now seeing that the fellows are maybe going to be a bigger impact and a bigger impact on the state of Maine, which is so um, phenomenal. But one thing I want to comment on about the judge as a boss is how far ahead of the game he was as somebody who hired and mentored and promoted women. And I'm going to say a few things about that, and then I'm going to give up the microphone. So first of all, he hired Laura Castor. Laura was his first female clerk. And when you think about it, she had to hold her own in the chambers with not only the judge, but um, you know, former Labor Secretary Bob Reich. <laughs> and she definitely did. You know, she's the one that invented the phrase clever. Um, and because she was extremely clever, um, and just the perfect first woman to clerk for the judge because of her, the richness of her life and her humor and her intellect. And it wasn't like she had it easy when she went home either because her husband was a classics professor. So there's a lot of smart people all around. Um, but I, in particular, had the great good fortune to be mentored by Laura because I, I mentioned I moved around in part depending on family reasons and at some point after I'd already launched my career, my mom, who had still lived in Chicago, had a recurrence of breast cancer. And I wanted to be with her, and I went back to Chicago, and I got a job at General Block, where Laura was a um, partner and a great role model for, woman, for women. And she was such a phenomenal mentor to me in that place. So going into a place of like, I don't know how many lawyers, there were 300, 400 people, and I knew almost nobody. And before it even happened, she reached out to me, and she was like, I'm so happy you're coming here. And she gave me really good and clear advice, career advice, and I got to see how she balanced the job of being a top-notch litigator at a serious litigation firm with uh, being a phenomenal human being and wife and mother, so that was super cool. Margaret Mar McGowey, who you don't know this, we've never talked about this, I really admired your career from afar. We only intersected once, in the First Circuit on opposite sides of the case, um, where I had like my big case that I'd been preparing for, and she had like five arguments she was doing that day. But um, seeing the career that you created for yourself, where you were able to stay in the place that you love and have the kind of family life that you love and a career at the highest level was such a cool thing to see. Um, and um, I felt loom whose desk I took over, so talk about filling big shoes. Um, you know, such a, um, you know, a former coffin lecturer herself, and um, as I'm sure you know, the, you know I mentioned about her um, clinic at Georgetown, I think the first federal legislation clinic anywhere, and she wrote the Americans with Disabilities Act, and was an EEOC commissioner, um, doing great work now in the private sector, and she's somebody that I've turned to for career advice at different stages, and she's just been a wonderful advisor and mentor to me. Um, and then the last person I'm going to mention, which is not the last person I should be talking about because there's so many phenomenal women, um, but Barbara Regalhout, um, you know, who was, you know, so brilliant to be able to, the smartest coffee clerk of all, to be able to figure out how to make the coffee clerkship last. <laughs> um, and what I want to say about that was I think I was her third cohort of co-clerks. And I know that Barbara arrived at her clerkship with an infant. Um, and that was new for the judge. And they did that, you know, Barbara being the first, you know, woman to do these kinds of things has to be like super great, okay? Um, and the judge realizing how super great she was, um, you know, figured out how to make that work. And then the next thing you know, when I'm clerking with her, now is coming along another child, and the judge and Barbara, and now Mass Court of Appeals Court Judge Peter Sachs created this really interesting job sharing agreement where Barbara worked part-time in the clerkship, and Peter Sachs did the other half of the clerkship. He had been a clerk for Judge Janu. And then in, in her other half, Barbara was you know, home with her children. And Peter, who had carpentry skills, was redoing the judge's <laughs> art studio <laughs> in the basement of his home. I mean, that was way ahead of the time. Uh, and I can't help that just to say about Barbara that um, I mean, I don't know if this is appropriate to say in this setting, so I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not like it's being taped. <laughs> One of the most hysterical moments of my clerkship was watching three-year-old Rachel describe to the judge 
how babies come out. <laughs> that wasn't entirely anatomically correct, but watching the judge listen to that straight face, so I think it's super appropriate that if this is any moment now, Rachel is about to have a baby and Barbara's about to become a grandmother. I just wanted to say what a wonderful um, mentoring career. And, and it's only been women, of course, there's often flirt men, and uh, so I guess because I've talked too much and I'll never take the microphone again, I just want to give one other example that um, the New England Innocence Project is a regional organization, but all, most of their work was focused in Boston. And I'm like, you need to do something in Maine. They have probably wrongful convictions in Maine, too. And they were like, well, we don't know how to do that. Like, how do we connect with people in Maine? And I called Dick O'Mara and Kate Smith, you know, both you know, partners in their firms and leaders in the field, and they knew how to do that. And they brought, to, they connected me with Deirdre Smith at, at the clinic and with um, other leading practitioners in the state who would have an interest in becoming part of an innocence network. And at the end of it, I, you know, I said to um, Dick, wow, this would be so cool if an innocence network creates, is created in Maine. And he's like, done, it's begun. <laughs> you know, and um, so that's the greatest gift is the clever. I'm going to start for the second time just by saying, wow. <laughs> um, so I have my phone out here, I'm like, I have some notes. So I'm going to, I could repeat so much of, of what others have said, I'm going to try to not do that. I think that, um, first of all, this is, hey, for none of us, I'm sure I'm speaking for, for more than myself here, and saying, this is not like an objective, neutral description. Like, I, love, I love Judge Collins. <laughs> just to be clear. Um, and I miss it. So, three ways. Professionally, um, the judge, uh, it, like others, we had lots of conversations about career path and what to do. And not only after leaving the clerkship, as you heard earlier, like I had lots of, you know, pretty peripatetic careers so at every juncture. It's like, okay, it's time to, to uh, you know, uh, pay a visit to. to Salmonic figure and, and, and touch base and see if I'm about to be making a really stupid decision. Um, the judge uh, reinforced for me the the benefit of being a generalist. Um, that there is this incredible and so and I've settled in and now is my second position as general counsel now, where you really get the opportunity to uh, stay aware of lots of different. Errors of the law, you know, developments in lots of different areas of the law. Um, so mile wide and an inch deep, maybe for some areas more than an inch deep. But it's 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 a it's a real um, blessing because uh, the magic often happens in the intersection of areas of the law or where there's innovation in one area of the law that people who are just expert in a different area are totally unaware of and are able to bring that over. Um, that's really cool and it, and it, and it um, has been professionally really gratifying, and the, the judge really advocated that I do that. He thought it would fit with my personality, and I'm really grateful because uh, I because I think that's true. Um, so personally, um, you know, no offense to other um, distinguished jurists in the room or who may hear this, the judge is just the, the best judge I've ever had the opportunity. <laughs> the, the best lawyer I've ever had the opportunity, and just as a human being, right? just to be able to have him um, exemplify what, what is possible in terms of cutting your way through the world and making a life. Um, incredibly smart, zero arrogance. In earnest and sincere and silly. <laughs> uh, critical and clear-eyed, but I have never heard the judge say a cynical word in his life. Um, which, uh, and particularly these years, is tough. Um, and actually, when I said a moment ago how much I miss him, I really miss, uh, I really wish I could call him and get his take on, on what's happening oh, here in our country. Uh, because I, I think that he, that he would find a way not to succumb to cynicism. And it's so hard uh, in, in, in light of everything that, that's going on. And I, I would love to hear a, a, a wise, not naive, to the contrary, uh, um, clear-eyed, critical, but still not cynical take on, on what's happening and 
a vision for <laughs> a, way, a way forward. Um, plus, um, so the, the year of my clerkship, I was living with my then uh, girlfriend and, and now wife. And um, just being in that space with, with Barbara and, and with the judge as the, the star around which we were all um, uh, revolving, it, it made it possible for Diana and I to, to imagine being married, to, to imagine creating our own family in a way that we really hadn't before when we were both in New York City and in graduate school and crazy, crazy. Um, so we got engaged that year and uh, the, the judge agreed to perform the ceremony the next year and so he married us. So um, he's responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, uh, civically. So what I think about our country and its government um, and the idea that it's possible and important and, and necessary to engage at that level uh, to, to make things better, um, and the importance of being a lawyer. Uh, once the judge said to me, we were working on some matter, and we were both saying that it was very painstaking and, and um, a, a, a little bit um, uh, narrow in, in its focus, and he said, you know, the day-to-day -day job of a lawyer can be like that. And it, it can be very much like a worker bee, where you're just carrying one little grain of, of speck of something to help to help build something. But when you pan back and look about what the greater effect is, when you see what the law is doing in society, I mean, let's face it, we as a country, we don't all share a common uh, background as in many other countries. We don't have a, a dominant uh, uh, religion or about to be ethnicity or language or or even values, it's very subjective. And what we have, I think, at the end of the day, uh, as our common denominator is the law. It can be a really unifying force and, and a really uh, um, just critically important, for, and, and the systems that we uh, work every day to, to keep focused and to, and to keep operative and to keep active um, in the legal systems to, to make that alive. Uh, it may feel like worker bees day to day, but we're really part of something that's incredibly important for the for the country, um, and he, he really taught me that. Um, I will stop there. Mm. So I never had the, the honor of, of meeting Judge Coffin, but I can say that the part of his legacy that certainly made itself into the Coffin Fellowship, and at least into my heart, is that uh, commitment to really not forgetting those who can't afford an attorney. And, um, you can serve in many different ways, but I think you know something that I, I keep hearing about Judge Coffin was his message of make sure you do it in a way that makes you come alive, that strikes a chord, or I should say strikes your chord, and, and really, really connects with you and fills you. And for me, what filled me when I was doing the Coffin Fellowship, and certainly in the, in the following years of my time at Pine Tree Legal, was that sincere, overwhelming, humbling gratitude that I would get from my clients who otherwise would not have had an attorney fighting for them. And um, that was weight, was worth, for me, its weight in gold. Um, I certainly wasn't being filled with dollars in my bank account, but that, that gratitude was just so real and really kept me going and inspired me. And so I wanted to bring some examples of that because I think that it's an, an honor to Judge Coffin to kind of see his legacy in that way. So the first example I have is, I brought props. <laughs> so um, I represented a, a young, remarkable woman who had been um, sexually abused by her father for many years and had never um, been able to speak up about it. And when she finally reached the age of majority, she connected with a sexual assault um, advocacy agency. Um, and the advocate supported her and gave her the strength to perhaps consider coming forward and um, referred her for assistance to Pine Tree Legal. And at the time when I met with her, she wasn't ready to make file a, a formal report with the police but was certainly considering doing so and before doing so wanted to ensure that she had some kind of protection in case criminal charges were in fact not prosecuted that she would be safe against any possible retaliation 
And so I helped her file a protection from abuse complaint and we went to court and secured a, a two year restraining order. I mean, they're called protection from abuse orders. Um, the experience can affect survivors in different ways. In her case, it was empowering to her and it made her feel like her voice mattered and that, um, that she would be heard. And so she painted me a picture. Oh. <laughs> and um, I think it was her way of telling me that she was, sorry, a little emotional, so <laughs> making, making you a mother. <laughs> she, um, she, it was her way of telling me that she was starting to leave the darkness and enter the light. And so. Oh. <laughs> and um, I'll just read another message from another client from a couple more. So, dear Caroline, I hope this finds you well. Words can never explain how much I appreciate all the time, effort, and support you devoted to the girls and me. I have missed you, and I hope you're doing well. We are very excited for our future. And we are all breathing eas easier thinking um, thanks to you. I know how much time you invested in our case. I will never forget you. You and your family are always in my prayers. <sighs> Caroline, finding myself in need of a lawyer was not a good feeling. It was scary facing the unknown. I had no clue what I was doing, but that was okay because I had you as a lawyer. You told me when I got nervous or scared to just look at you because you were in court, not there, not only to provide representation, but to support me. It wasn't just words, you were there, offering a smile at times when I wanted to cry. Another client, Caroline, I just wanted to call you today and thank you for representing my daughter. You know, I was a victim of assault more than once, and I told my daughter that today was not only a victory for her, but for a lot of women whose voice is not heard and protection does not happen. And I just want to thank you for the work you did to make sure my daughter was safe. I can't thank you enough. God bless you. Caroline, I appreciate your advice and taking the time to show me my options. What you and your organization helped with me, helped me with, truly changed our lives. And I can never extend my gratitude enough. And it is, you know, even though my career has now changed and I'm working for the courts, it's really in their honor that I took this position. and. Um, it's their resilience and, and their story and their truth that I keep in mind when I go to work every day to try to make the courts a little better. Yeah. So I will tell one of the more compelling client stories I have now, um, but pretty briefly. So I represented, um, and I think that this highlights a lot of what Caroline was talking about and a lot of the principles that we've heard about the judge. Um, I represented a client in my first year of the Cotton Fellowship, and I'll refer to her by her initial R. Um, she had been sexually assaulted by somebody at her college where she was attending, and after the sexual assault, she wasn't planning to report it or go forward in any way, but she started being stalked by this student. Um, and after the stalking had been going on for a while, the student then reported her and said that she had physically, that my client had physically attacked her. Um, and the school came to my client and said, would you agree to do no contact orders between the two of you? And my client said yes, because she just wanted to keep this person away from her. Mm -hmm. um, and so she ended up agreeing to these no contact orders, but despite that, the stalking continued. So um, the other student had applied to work at the same work study um, job as my client. She um, would follow her around in different social situations and it got so bad that when I met with my client for the first time she said I really am considering dropping out of school and so her stated objective from the beginning was to be able to feel safe enough to continue going to school so the first thing I helped her with I helped her file for a protection from abuse order and we were granted that order in district court um, and so that laid out that um, the other student wasn't allowed to contact her, wasn't allowed near her place of work, um, and at first that seemed to be working. But then, because they attended the same school, the other student kind of continued with some of these stalking behaviors. And so I helped my client follow up with the school and say, look, I have this protection order. These are the provisions of it. These are the ways in which the boundaries are being pushed or it's being violated. Um, and so with my help, we ended up doing some meetings with the school and tweaking their no contact orders. 
and getting it to a place where it was livable and workable for her and where it was actually working. And I think it was a situation where the other student was really pushing boundaries, right? The other student wanted to say, okay, well, they put this in place, but now I'm going to push the boundaries in this way, or I'm going to see how far I can take it. Um, and so it took a couple of meetings and a couple of revisions of the no contact order, I think, before she realized that we weren't going to let it go, right? My client wasn't going to just back away. And I think part of what gave her the strength to do that was the fact that she had an attorney who was willing to go to court with her and go to these meetings and kind of follow up on these things. Um, and that was a really fulfilling case to work on. It was, it was, she was a great client. Um, and I happened to, this is one of the great things about practicing me, and I happened to run into her um, a couple of years later. And she said to me, you know, I, I graduated school and I'm getting a job in my field, um, which was a pretty specialized field, so I was pretty impressed that she had gotten a job in it. Um, and I, I was like, congratulations. And she said, I never would have been able to graduate school if you hadn't helped me because that would have been too much. It would have been too hard to go through that without having an advocate on my side. Um, and so I think that I think that that's the important work. I mean, I think having an attorney is is so important. It can make such a difference um, for people in poverty. And when I think about the way that Caroline and I, and I know all the Coffin fellows have approached our cases, a lot of it is about treating people with um, dignity and with empathy. That seems so in line with what Judge Coffin stood for. Um, and I think that that's such an important. You know, not all of our cases like that. That's a great case, and it was a win. Both of us have worked on cases that were not wins, but I think that you know we've been able to offer advocacy and a voice for people even when they haven't succeeded on the legal front, and that that really shifts people's experience with the legal field when they have an advocate who's on their side, who's listening to them and giving them advice, whether or not they're successful in actual legal proceeding. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to go two hours. We're about there now. But if anybody in the audience wants to raise anything, we'll do it for the next couple of minutes. Anyone have a question? I, I, I don't have a question, but I do want to say, this is Kai Feldblum, that I have listened to so many panels in my life. And this has been one of the most amazing, amazing <laughs> ones I have heard. The judge and Ruth are looking down, and I'm so happy. And I also want to say for you a little comment about it is being taped. I have not been doing as much social media recently, you know, just changing jobs. I am absolutely posting this, <laughs> tweeting this. I am going to do that every month to say if you have not listened to something that could give you inspiration, listen to this. So thank you, thank you. Uh, for helping us see that the judge's legacy is indeed strong, and we can continue out in the lobby chatting with each other. Thank you. Thank you.